For the last three weeks, and, and again today and next week, for, for five weeks, we're doing something called Everybody Always. A guy by the name of Bob Goff one time was speaking in church, and he says, I just think that God wants us to love everybody, always. And so he went and rewrote a book about that, and we're studying that book, and our life groups were seeing video, hearing Bob himself talk and uh, encourage us. And Bob himself, um, he says he struggles with something called impatience. I don't know if anybody here struggles with impatience, but you just got to have it now. Come on, get out of my way. And so let me tell you a story about, that he tells about something that happened to him that was, was pretty remarkable. He travels quite a bit. He, he's on a plane all the time. He says sometimes he travels from, uh, from San Diego to uh, no, the northwest. It would be either Portland or Seattle, somewhere up there. One time of his life, for several years, he did that every day, Monday through Friday, five days a week. But he'd be home for dinner time. His kids didn't even know until they were like teenagers that he was gone that much. And he, he said, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And you said, Dad, that you've been going downtown. You work downtown. He goes, well, I do. I just didn't tell you which downtown. But he's always on the plane. But it's very important for him to be home at night. He likes to come home to his wife. He calls her Sweet Maria, okay? So he, he might be in Texas having an engagement, and he has to be in New York the next morning. He'll fly home to San Diego to be with his family. And then the next morning, he'll fly to New York. And so this is where impatience comes in. On one occasion, he was preaching out in Texas. A friend of his invited him to preach. So he comes out and he's preaching. He does great. But it's a tight little schedule to get the rental car back to the airport and for him to get on the plane home to be with his wife, Sweet Maria. He says, I find myself um, dealing with patience and impatience. And so what I've done is this. He was reading a children's book, and he read this line in the children's book. It said, whatever you fill your bucket with is what you will become. Whatever is in your bucket, that's what you'll become. And so he went out and he bought himself a small bucket. He actually bought himself an aluminum bucket, but this is as close as I could find. And he took it everywhere with him. And he says, this was a reminder to me in those times when I was feeling impatient that, no, 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 Bob. You have put patience in your bucket. You are becoming patience. And so I find myself in the rental car, he says, and I'm coming up, and there are like three lanes to return the rental car. And I just, like you in the Publix, I picked one, and it was the slow lane. And I'm sitting there, and the other two lanes are going by me, and I'm just sitting here, and I've got that guy. The guy who's talking to the car three in front of me, and then two in front of me, and then one in front of me, where five minutes turns to 10 minutes, 10 minutes turns to 20 minutes, and I'm going to miss my flight. And so I'm f having all of these thoughts on the inside. When the guy finally pulls up, he says to me, hey, how was your trip? Did you enjoy your car? And he said, in that moment, the old Bob Goff would have reached over and grabbed the bucket and clocked the guy with it. <laughs> said, no, you made me miss my plane. But he says, in this moment, I decided... <laughs> you know what, I'm going to draw out that patience. And so he said, actually, I had a good trip. I really enjoyed being here in Texas. The car had no problems with it. Everything went, went perfectly. Thanks for asking. And so they did their deal. He said, I did miss my flight. And now I was making my way to the airport, walking across the parking lot with my bucket. And as I'm walking over, that attendant comes running up to me. And he says, oh, one more thing, sir. That was a great sermon you preached this morning. You were there, he thought. You were there, and I was this close to discrediting everything by telling you what I really felt about you. <laughs> okay? I know all of us have been there, but I want to ask you a question. What is in your bucket? What is in your bucket? If you put patience there, you will be a little more easygoing than everybody knows you to be because you're impatient. If you put time there, you will spend time with other people. Make them feel uh, like they're the most important person. If you put love there, people will love to be around you. So I want to ask you this morning, what is in your bucket? Cindy Heiberg was the pastor. Uh, her husband was the pastor. For 18 years, Denny was the pastor here at this church. And Cindy, uh, his wife, uh, was the, the pastor's wife. And she came up here on one Sunday, and she stood before the congregation and said, the Lord has called me to a ministry of availability. He wants me to make myself available, so I need to put time in or set aside time so that in case anybody interrupts my day, interrupts my schedule, comes barging into my world, I've got time for them. 
And then Cindy Eisenshank. Hey, Cindy, you're the one that brought this to my attention because two years ago, Cindy helped us to get our life groups relaunched back up where they're very healthy. And uh, we thank God for you, Cindy, and the work that you did in laying, relaying that foundation for us. But after two years, she says, okay, I feel like I've done this, but something Cindy Heiberg said to me is speaking to me. And I've got neighbors, people in my cul-de-sac, folks in my life who are reaching out, and I'm finding I don't have the time to give to them because of this, this job. And so I would like to shift into a, a ministry of availability. And I thought that was so beautiful and so inspiring. Not all of us can quit our jobs, but that's okay to make yourselves available. But Cindy, you are now being used by God to, to be there for other people. So I want to ask you, what is your ministry of availability? Some buckets are too full to put anything else in that bucket. So what do you need to pour out of your bucket that you might put in what needs to go there? What is it if you had, maybe it's not patience. That's not your thing or time. That's not your thing. Maybe you have a short wick. Maybe you have a, 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 an anger issue, an anger problem, and so that needs to, to come out so that you could put something in there uh, called love and, and even patience in that way. I don't know what it is. What needs to come out? But let me say this too. Not all of us have to pour anything out of our bucket to add things to it. Just two or three weekends ago, uh, our staff, our ministry team, as well as some of the key leaders of the church went to Greenhouse Church for their GLC 2018. Uh, it was Greenhouse Leadership Conference where they're uh, really helping us to understand what it means to be churches and to be Christians who are making disciples who make disciples. That's what we're all about here. And we say uh, quite a bit that every one of us should have three people in our lives, a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. A Paul is that mentor, somebody who's been down this road longer than we have that can pour into my life. The Barnabases are the folks that you and I are traveling together with uh, on this journey. But the Timothy is when we look for somebody who is, maybe they're new in the faith, maybe they're not even a believer yet, but they need a Paul to come along and to reach out and say, follow me as I follow Christ. So we're over at Greenhouse, and they're talking about how we need to do this and, and different ways of doing it and to make time. But one particular uh, person stood up, and he says, I know what you're thinking. You're asking every single one of us to make sure that we are in position to mentor or disciple or influence another person. But how can I find and, and squeeze one more thing onto my plate? How, how can I make room for one more thing? I live a very busy life, and I don't think you understand. And he says, I'm not asking you to add anything. Don't add a single thing to your life. All you need to do is invite somebody into your life. Invite somebody along with you as you do your life. Maybe you are going to make a visit to somebody who is really down, and you're going to bring some flowers. Why not invite a friend? And now here comes your Timothy with you or your Barnabas, however you want to look at it, and you are now doing life together. You're going to a ball game last night, all right? And you're screaming your, your lungs out, <laughs> your voice is gone. And so is your friend because you invited them to be there with you. Let's do life together. And that way, it's not a matter of how can I, you know, chalk up three, four, five, six other relationships that I don't have room for. Invite them into your existing life. Levi Lowry says, that's mostly true. That's mostly true. But for most of us, we have to be intentional, and there are some things we do need to take out of our bucket to make room for other people, and particularly for uncomfortable things in uncomfortable people. If we do that, that's going to take some intentionality. Jesus was a master at this, taking time to spend with uncomfortable people. At least he made people uncomfortable with the ones that he ate with. He made them uncomfortable because to eat with somebody means that you accept them. It doesn't mean that you accept their lifestyle, accept their opinions and their, their political views, all of that kind of stuff, but you accept them as a person. And you are my friend or you are my family and we're going to do life together and that's fine, that's good. Jesus did this. I don't know if you remember the story of Jesus calling Matthew the tax collector. He said, come, follow me. And Matthew left his job and he said, I will follow you. And he follows Jesus. The next thing in the story, the way the scripture writers write it, is that uh, Matthew throws a party, brings all of his friends together. They're also tax collectors. They're also the people on the outskirts. They weren't the religious folks. Jesus comes to this party that he invited him to. And so the religious people look in and they say to the disciples of Jesus, how is it that your master, your rabbi, your teacher, he, he eats with sinners? 
This makes no sense. So it made them very uncomfortable. I'm going to break my neck up here. It makes them very uncomfortable. Luke 5, 31 and 32, Jesus responds this way. It's on the screen behind me. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus seemed to love sinners. And he calls you and me to do the same thing. In your bulletin this morning, you came in, and there's this card that says, Everybody Always. And, and on the back of it, it's a, it's a uh, memory card from Luke 5, 31 and 32. Let's read this out loud together. Can we do that? It's either up here or, or right here. Let's all go. Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why not post that in your, your bathroom on the mirror? You know, every morning you see it as you're getting ready to go to school or go to work. And you take a look at this and you commit it to memory in six or seven days' time. Because this is important to God, it's important to us. But then you ask, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I uh, find myself invited to the Matthew parties? Uh, to the places where the people are who need a touch from God? Well, actually the scriptures give us a very brief list that if you just do these things, you'll meet Jesus. And you'll meet the people that need to meet Jesus, okay? It's in Matthew 25, and before you put it on the screen, let me just tell this story. Uh, we've all heard it. I've even shared this two, three weeks ago. It's the story of when the Son of Man comes at the end of time in, in the judgment. He says, I'm going to separate out the sheep from the goats. And what he's doing, he's talking about you and me. And he's separating out from those who say they know the right things to do and those who are actually doing it. And so in this, he gives us a list because he says, um, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was looking in as an outsider, but you brought me in. I, I was naked and you clothed me. I, I was uh, in sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you visited me there. And so if you just look at this list, they said to him, when, Jesus, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or, or sick or in prison? We don't remember that. And he says, inasmuch as you've done it to these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. So whenever you and I feed a hungry person, we're feeding Jesus. Whenever we give a sip of cold water to somebody who's thirsting, we're doing that for Jesus. And that's not simply, it is literally the hungry and the thirsty and the poor, the destitute. But how many people do you know who are experts in their field? I mean, you talk with them, you realize real quick you are out of the league. They're out of your league. You have no idea what they're talking about. Maybe they're a doctor, they're an attorney, they're a teacher. They're somebody that's really sharp about their area. But then when you start to talk about the things of God, it's like, Wow. They're way back in kindergarten because of the, the, the views that we had when we were children have never been developed beyond that. And so they're, they're emaciated. They're starving. And you and I are in a position to feed and to give drink and, and nourishment and encouragement. Let's do that. Let's feed hungry people. Let's give drinks to thirsty people. Let's invite strangers in. How about uh, putting clothes on naked people, people who feel vulnerable, how about tending to the sick and visiting those in prison? Here's the thing. When we feed the hungry, we're feeding Jesus. That person sitting disheveled on the park bench that you may see many times a week, that's Jesus. What if you were the one who went up and befriended them, gave them the dignity of a conversation? Maybe you bring some McDonald's and sit down and say, I don't know if you've eaten or not, but I always love these things, and probably you do too, and you, you enjoy Big Mac together. That would give dignity to somebody. Now you're building a bridge to the folks that Jesus knows they need a touch from the Lord. People say, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. The trouble is, not a lot of us are giving away fish or fishing poles, are we? We say something like that and we stay away. Let's get engaged. Let's be the ones that go to those who need a touch from the Lord. Here's the point. We feed Jesus when we take time to feed the hungry. A couple things happen when we do that. Here's what happens. One, God gets our hearts. When we engage people who are in need, something happens to our hearts. Something happens right here. God wants us to serve and wants us to become available not because he needs us, but because he wants our hearts. 
You know, I think of Alison Ungera, who is a, a mother of like five kids. Uh, at the time, she was a homemaker, and the Lord wrecked her about the, 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 the human trafficking. Let me put it that way. We've got children in the, in the room. And so she wanted to do something about it here in Gainesville. And so she's done something about it. And some of you are involved with Created Gainesville that, that gives dignity to those workers in that field, in that industry, and brings them out of that and, and offers safety. And, and there's a house being built on a safe place so that they can transition out of that lifestyle and be reintroduced into society with the dignity that they were created with. I think of my own daughter, Sarah Beth Thompson, who uh, the Lord has just wrecked her heart for those who are thinking about aborting their children. They're unwanted. It was unexpected. It was unplanned. So she works with an organization called CIRA. And, and to talk with Sarah Beth, you know, I come home at nighttime, and, you know, I don't know about you, but I have been working hard all day long. I've been dealing with the problems of the world and the problems that come to us in our lives. I just want to go home and relax. And this is usually when she brings something to my attention. Did you know that this was going on? And I'm like, Sarah Beth, you are wearing me out. But she needs to wear me out. We need to be worn out because there are people who are worn out. And she is in a position where God's got her heart. And I can go on and talk about other people, but let's keep moving. God gets our hearts. Another thing that happens is God reaches people through their needs. Uh, people, last week I mentioned that there are people uh, who know their needs versus others who feel that they don't really have any needs. And the ones who know their needs are pursuing God. I know this because last week I said that Jesus mentioned to the religious elite, he said to them, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, they are making it to the kingdom ahead of you. And how could he say that? Well, they knew their need, that they were needy, busted, and broken. And God reaches people when they feel that they are desperate. So opening up to God and seeing Jesus in that person is recognizing my own need and also moving toward people who recognize theirs. Let's do life together with those who feel like that they are forfeit, they have forfeit their, their place in the kingdom, that they're exempt from these good, these good promises. No, they're not. You're the very people that God wants to lavish his love upon you. And then another thing that happens, he doesn't just get our hearts, uh, he doesn't just meet people through our needs, but God grows us up to be more like Jesus he grows us up by letting us do things and experience uncomfortable things. Because comfortable people don't feel they need Jesus. Desperate people do. It's the desperate among us that are responding to the kingdom. So here's three things that I'm going to ask you to write down to put in your bucket. You may have your own things, the patience that you need to put in there, the love and the time. But every one of us need to put these three items in our bucket. The first is humility. We need to fill our buckets with humility. Humility to understand another person. Don't follow the lead of some of our politicians these days who boast how great thou, they are, <laughs> not how great thou art, how great they are and how wonderful things are going because they are in position. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus' lead. He exemplified humility. We're baffled by the times that Jesus would do something amazing for someone and then would say, shh, don't tell anybody. He didn't want his left hand to know what his right hand was doing when he was giving to another person. And you and I shouldn't either. We should be humble in approaching people. When you approach someone in need, whether they're hungry or thirsty, they're a stranger, they're, they're naked or sick or in prison, if you come with all the answers, don't expect that they're gonna receive you well. Don't expect that you're going to make much of a difference, or even that you will be changed yourself. But when you show up with humility, it's in your bucket. I'm working on humility. It's an attitude of wanting to understand that I want to walk a mile in another person's shoes, then people are more willing to let you in. Put humility in your bucket. The second thing, empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone, and, and that's good. When somebody loses a loved one and you feel something there, that's good. But empathy is walking alongside them in their pain. Put empathy to listen in your bucket. This week, um, Connie Nixon, I see Connie out there. She and I, um, uh, I, I met her at the hospital where she works. And Connie is a nurse practitioner at Shands in the pediatric cardiology unit. She works with kids who are receiving heart transplants. 
and, and we got to talking uh, about uh, some things, and she, she told me that there's this video that they train the Shans workers with from the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, I want you to take a look at this and, and do your best to read what's going on in every person you see there. Take a look at this. Empathy is intentional awareness. That's the target on the wall of everybody always. None of us are anywhere close to hitting that target every time, but what if we practiced? That's why they, they show this to the hospital workers, to just give us practice, give us awareness of practicing, listening, and taking it in around us. What if we practice seeing through the eyes of God that every single person you encounter is Jesus and you get to be Jesus to them? The third thing, the final thing I want to say to put in your bucket is humility, I said, is, is empathy, but also action. To love and to make a difference. Nobody said it better than Nike when they said, say it with me, just do it. Jesus didn't say, just agree with me. He said, obey what I, I teach you to tell you. Follow my lead. Do what I do. Say what I say. What would that look like this week, today? Monday. What would that look like for you? Here's your challenge. What needs to go in your bucket? Is it patience? Is it faith? Is it those sorts of things? Is it empathy? Is it humility? Is it action? What is it that needs to, to go into your bucket? How can you make that your next step? Starting today. To actively and actually make yourself do the patient thing. To open your eyes to the next 10 people you encounter and ask, I wonder what they might be going through right now. Just listen. What needs to come out of your bucket? What, what is it that you need to make more room for, to make more time and availability for others? What would a ministry of availability look like for you? And instead of adding one more thing to your plate, what could you invite others to join you in doing that you're already doing as a disciple? But then they would learn, oh, this is what it looks like, and they could ask their questions, and they can give their insights and you and I can grow. Keep it simple. Remember the list from Matthew 25. Let's find a hungry person and feed them, a thirsty person and give them something to drink. Somebody who is displaced, who feels like an outsider looking in, and what if you reached out and said, welcome, we're, we're glad you're here. Just by the way, in our uh, chapel going on right now is the first Sunday of a new church launch from a Gainesville, uh, it's called the Gospel Church uh, Gainesville Chinese. It's a Chinese launch, and it's starting right now. And right afterwards, the two Sunday, adult Sunday school classes, the Sojourners and the Companions in Christ, are throwing them a reception to say, we're glad that you're here. We are so glad that you are here. They've got teenagers over there and children over there as well. And when you see them on campus, I want you to do the same thing. Keep it simple and say, you're a stranger, let me get to know you. Naked, vulnerable, sick, in prison, let's not forget these. The more you do this, the more you encounter Jesus. And finally, as a challenge this week, find somebody that you could engage with that you have been avoiding. And you feel, you know what, God, is, he's just not letting you off. You keep remembering this person or this group of people or whatever. And you say, okay, this is going to be the week that I engage this person. I dare you to just do it. Amen?